We're still in Ephesians. And what you've experienced today is um, we, we had technical difficulties, which was why there was no music, no words on the wall, nothing, because it just didn't work, which was God's plan, obviously, right? God's plan, because this was fabulous. But what we experienced today was it says to, to um, speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And what you've experienced today is spiritual songs. Because the psalms comes out of the word, the hymns are what we know of, you know, the great hymns of old and everything. But spiritual songs is what happens spontaneously when the Holy Spirit releases a song or music or something from our heart. That's the, the psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. So what you, what you have in partaked of, partaken of, whatever, of today... <laughs> Of Ephesians chapter 5, which is where we are now. This is the goodness of God. Amen. Now, let tell you what, what goes when this happens? Religion. People get uncomfortable. People aren't sure what's going on. People aren't sure if they can trust it. People are a little bit freaky. But it is spontaneous worship. It was it was free flowing from the Holy Ghost. And it's what's talked about in the so as long as you can trace everything back to the word of God, it's on solid foundation. And this came out of the word of God. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And freedom in the Holy Ghost. So we're on a bit of a journey, not quite sure where we're going, what we're headed for. God's will, God's heart, God's way. That's all that matters. And some weeks ago, just to lay a bit of a blueprint, foundation, whatever. Some weeks ago, we had um, a spiritual visitation by men in white denim who came in and measured. And they came in and they measured and it's kind of like... And then just as quickly, they walked out and the last one said to me as he passed, our job is done. And I wanted to say so badly, what job? Like what? was what was done but before I could even get it out of my mouth the second group came in and they handed me a scroll with the price of our prayer on it and it was a scroll of purity our mandate from heaven is to be a pure house and it was just a scroll of purity this is the call of God upon this house holiness purity Joy, because all of that flows out of holiness. Holiness is a joyful thing. I mean, you just got to see what goes on in Revelation around the throne as they're crying out, holy, 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 and throwing their crowns down before him. It's like an amazing thing. But this is what he said. And so today during our prayer time before church, before our gathering, we rolled the mandate, the scroll of purity across the so that purity would start to seep into us. That we'd be walking on the purity, the foundation of purity. That God can do in us what he wants. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so Ephesians chapter 5 is about purity. It's all about purity. So I'm only going to do the first 21 verses. Sounds like a lot. But, you know, I promise we've got, to, we've got to get to the end of Ephesians at some time, don't we? But this is, a, this is about purity. So the beautiful thing is Ephesians chapters 1, 2 and 3 is about the wealth of who we are, the wealth of what we have and the wealth of God. It's about our identity, blessed, chosen, accepted, loved, you know, all of that is about our identity um, about where we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. Chapters um, 4 and 5 and the first 10 verses or first 9 verses of chapter 6 is about our walk. How do you walk the wealth out? How do you live that on earth as a new creation? How do you do that? And then the last part is warfare. And what God is saying in the way Ephesians is structured is you've got to know who you are and what you have and you've got to be able to live it 
before you can even be entrusted to go into warfare. And what's happened in the past is that, you know, we're, we've gone into war, but we haven't really known who we are and what we have. We haven't been walking it out in the right way. And so there's backlash and counterattack and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But so we go through it the way God has said in his word. When we enter into warfare, you wrestle and then stand. And you stand. And you can stand because you know your wealth. You know who you are. You know what you have. You can stand because you're walking it out. So you can stand. So it's recognising that there's a flow. And also with this purity that God is, is um, working in us because, you know, let's, let's face it, we're all under construction, you know, like just the grace. I had my grandkids that sleep overnight this week. I don't know whether I'm getting old or they're getting young, but whatever it was, sometimes the grace kind of lifted just a tad. It's like, I'm going to sleep. I'm just going to sleep. <laughs> And when they did go to sleep, I'm still awake on the lounge making sure that they stay there. <laughs> so, but Ephesians chapter 5, this is really, it starts off with a key verse and then it goes through and it, or the whole way through it's contrast. He is contrasting things. So we've got communion there and we've got communion over there. So what I want you to do, and don't feel embarrassed or anything about people, we can even put communion over here on a chair. Shane, could you do that for me, please? One of the trays over here. So when we go through this and you feel, oh, gosh, I'm, you know, I feel conviction there or I just want to get this right with God, come and take communion. Have a covenant meal. Just say, yeah, God, I realise I haven't got quite this where, it, where it's supposed to be, so I really want to get this purity with you. I want this. And so this is all this is because this is, this is changing. It can come across as like, oh, you know, shake the finger. But really this is a contrast. And in chapter 4, it says, I want you to walk worthy of the call of God upon your life. Walk worthy. In chapter 5, the very first verse, he says, you've got to be an imitator of God. Not imitate Paul, not imitate Jesus, but you've got to imitate God. Like, how do you imitate God? You do it because he's your father. And children imitate their parents. Children imitate the ones that bring them up. They imitate mum and dad. You know, we have sayings like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We have sayings like far, like father, like son. And so we've got this, this thing happening where he's actually saying, I want, you to, um, I want you to be an imitator of God as well-beloved children imitate their father. Imitate God. And that's a huge kind of like, where do you even start with that? Right? Where do you start with that? And then he goes on to tell you, he says, I want you to walk in love, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. He says, I want you to imitate God, copy him, follow his example. As a well-beloved child uh, imitates their father. And then he says in verse 2, and walk in love. Now, love does not mean covering things up. Love does not mean... Um, I'm going to accept what you're doing. Love is, I'm going to actually tell you the truth in love, like it says earlier back in Ephesians chapter 4. Love means I'm going, to, I'm going to speak truly, I'm going to deal truly, I'm going to live truly, but it's going to be in love. And love is not wishy-washy, mills and boon type of romantic stuff. This is I want nothing but God's highest and best for you. That's what I want, God's highest and best for you. That's what love is, if you walk in love. What is the highest? What is the best? Right? What is the highest and what is the best? So I'm going to, so it's almost like what Paul is saying is this is absolutely impossible for us to imitate God and then walk in love. I mean, who knows that there are people that you don't really want to walk in love with? <laughs> just occasionally? Just occasionally? Or is it just me that seems to meet the unlovely? But he's, he's, this is what he's saying. I want you to walk in love. That means every step. Walk every step. Not just when you feel like it, not just in a difficult situation, but every step with every person, walk in love. And how can you do that? Can't. Without the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. 
you know, it says uh, that the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts. He continually flows the Father's love into our hearts so that it can flow out through us. Because, you know, like if, if he stopped, I would stop. But he continually floods our hearts with love so that we can flow it out to other people. Because we can't love people in our own strength. We get frustrated. We can get exasperated. We can get, when will they ever listen? When will they learn? How long have I got to put up with this? Even Jesus himself said, how long have I got to put up with you guys? You know, when, when they didn't do some things right. But, you can, but you've got to love. And the, the, the word says that when we love people, the world will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a witness. It's our evangelism tool, if you like, walking in love. And so it's recognising that you must walk in love, even by the power of the Holy Spirit, it pours that love into us, but we walk in love. And so he's saying here, this is what I want you to be, imitating God, walking in love as Christ loved us. So how was that? That was sacrificial. That was Jesus laying down his life for us. And we don't often preach in church about sacrificial love or sacrificial generosity. We don't often talk about it, but a sacrificial lifestyle should be our lifestyle. Because we picked up our cross and follow him. And so he says, I want you to give yourself up so that you can be a sweet fragrance to God. Right? Sweet fragrance to God. So he says, this, this is what I've called you to do. Represent the Father, walk in love, and love as Jesus Christ loved. The reason? So your life will be a sweet sacrifice. That God will just look at you and smell that fragrance. Go, oh, I love that child. And so the contrast comes up. And there are contrasts all the way through. And as we go through this, let the Holy Spirit talk because the path is narrowing. The path is narrowing. Our nation is coming to a defining moment with some of the legislation that's been pushed through, federal, state, We need the mercy of God on our nation. But judgment, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, judgment starts in the house of God. That's why we're going we're gonna to allow the Holy Spirit to clean us up so we can walk as true lights and stand in the gap for our nation. Cannot stand in the gap if I am stained with the same sin as the nation has. But when we're in Christ, when we're purified, we can stand in the gap and we can, we can do this. So he says in verse 3, he says, But immorality, sexual vice, all impurity, greediness must not even be named among you, as is fitting and proper among the saints. So he's saying that there's a, there's a sharp line here right now. You cannot go the way of the world. You cannot go the way of immorality, pornography. You can't go the way of this. You have got to live a clean life before Christ. There is a line here. You've got to imitate God. You've got to walk as God. You've got to love. And if you love, if you truly loved yourself and truly loved others, you would not perform any of these things. So he says there's a delight of but it's a line in the sand, a delineating factor right here. You cannot even have this named among you. Right? And so, you know, whatever, Father, if you think that there's anything on our names that has been named over us that comes from this, God, we come before you and we ask your forgiveness. That our name, we don't, we don't want our names associated with any of this in verse 3. Separate our names from the sins that we would not even be named among us. You have called, you, you know, if you're truly a disciple of Jesus, it's a narrow path. 
and it's a path that's well lit, but it's lit by the blood of the Lamb and it's lit by the path of the cross and it's lit by the resurrection power of Christ. But it is a path of holiness and purity. It is a path of dedication and absolute abandonment to the will and the way and the purpose of God. And it is a way where we can say, you know what, I'm no longer going to have one foot in this camp and one foot in that camp. I am holy and solely living for Christ. And so we don't even want anything named upon us. That, that even smacks of that. So, Father, if there is anything that people have spoken over us that has linked our names to those kinds of sins, and I'm just thinking of me and my love for potatoes. I don't care if they're mashed, fried, whipped. I don't care. I, you know, but that's greed, right? I'm just, it's greed. So I don't want my name associated with that, so I have to change so I can repent, turn away from it. I still have occasional, but not lustfully. Or turn away from it and turn to God. So that greed, gluttony, is not associated with me. Right? This is kind of like a somber afternoon, but it's the goodness of God reaching out and saying, you know what? It's time to allow me to clean you up because I've got a call of God on your life and on this house and I need people that are dedicated. I need people that are hallowed and separated and set apart for the purpose of God and do not have feet in both camps. And so he says, don't even let these things be named among you. And so there needs to be a, a clear um, delineation, dark and light, um, can't even be named because in verse 2, love has nothing to do with these things. You know, um, what, what it says there, the immorality, the impurity, the greediness, love is not connected with those things in any way. So if we're walking in the love of God, those things wouldn't even be in our lives. And in verse 4, he says, let there be, and this is about our words. The other one was about what people might say about us. But this is about our words. And he says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish and sinful um, talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting or becoming, but instead voice your thankfulness to God. So he's saying no unnecessary words of disgrace. And that word there in verse 4, one of the, the um, sinful talk, the foolish talk, the word there in the Greek is morologia, which is mentioned only once in the Bible, and that is in this place, only once. And it is a speech that comes out of a dull, sluggish heart that has lost its grip on reality. That's a bit, oh, really, God, seriously? And foolishness is giving your time and, in, and attention to what is not important. Can you sense the, the presence of God or the anointing shifted here a little bit? It's time to walk in holiness, purity, not just know that what's happened because of the cross and the blood, but actually say, you know what, God, I want a circumcised lifestyle. And they said the contrast to this is thankfulness, gratitude. If you live a life of gratitude and thankfulness, then this kind of talk will not come out of your mouth because there's no room for it. You're constantly thanking God for his goodness, thanking God for his goodness, thanking God for his kindness, thanking God for his compassion, his mercy, thanking God for what he's done, thanking God for answered prayers. Thank you, God, that I woke up and got another day. Thank you, God, for saving my family. Thank you, God, for working behind the scenes. There is so much to thank him for. But he says if you do this, then there's no room out of your mouth. No unnecessary words that would disgrace will come forth. There will be no words that come out of a dull, sluggish heart that's lost its grip on reality and you will not be giving your time and attention to what is not important. Number five is about behaviour. So the first one's about reputation. This last one was about words, but verse five is about behaviour. So he's saying right here, is there anything that you have placed before God? Comfort food. I have placed comfort food before God. When my mum was alive, 
I would ring her if something went wrong before I went to God. False refuge. We all have false refuges where we go for comfort, for safety, for, oh, I just can't cope, so I'm just going here first. Then we, we get it right with God, okay? But why, why don't we just go straight to God? What is Because idolatry can come in different forms. You know, it says here in verse 5, be sure of this, that no one practicing sexual vice or impurity, that impurity could be anything, you know, in, in thought or in life, or one who is covetous or is an idolater. And has no. And this person, it says, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. No inheritance. So sometimes, you know, that we have people, and I'm going to be blunt here this afternoon, but there are people in, the, in churches that actually say, well, you know what, I just can't seem to access the kingdom. No matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to quite experience what other people are experiencing. Possibly they are an idolater without even recognising that they have put something before God. Because let me tell you, I didn't see comfort food as putting something before God. But it is. It was when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and said, seriously, girl, you can need to sort this out because it is limiting your access into the kingdom. And we all have areas. I hope you love me and you're going to come back next week. But you all have areas. <laughs> you won't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have areas where we tend to put something before God. And I put my my income coming in. Well, you know, things that happen. I think, oh, well, I can just use the next next pay. I can do that, or I can budget for that. But that was putting my budget before the provision of my God. So there's areas. I'm preparing this, and I'm diving into communion. You know, dear God, this is a narrow path. I'd kind of been walking it a bit wide, <laughs> but it's a narrow path. So is there anything that we place before God? It could even be a loved one. It could even be a loved one. So he says, this is your behaviour. And he, and he says... Um, there's actually two kingdoms mentioned, if you notice. He said he's an idolater and will have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Two kingdoms, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God. Kingdom of Christ is present. And after everything is brought under Jesus' feet, it then goes to God for his kingdom. And he says you'll have... Uh, no place in the present kingdom, and you definitely won't inherit in the final one. We can't allow anything in these days, regardless of legislation or anything else, that would come before God. He says the first commandment, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and then love others as you love yourself. If you love him with that, then man, I tell you what, there's no room for anything else, is there? <clears throat> and in verse 6 he says, don't let anyone delude you or deceive you with empty excuses or groundless arguments for through these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of rebellion and disobedience. He said these are empty words. And how many times have we been caught up with people speaking empty words, words that have, um, you know, like just empty. They're deceptive. They're deceptive. They promise no life. There's nothing in them. They're empty. They are to deceive. They take us into stupid arguments trying to get people to see the truth. They distort God's pattern. They distort God's design. They distort God's image. And um, we are supposed to be the image bearers of God. So if somebody comes to you and you recognise that they are carrying empty words, they're not open to the truth, don't get involved. Just turn and walk away. When they're ready to hear the truth, you'll know. 
But you know what? Otherwise, you're going to get caught up in stupid arguments, groundless arguments, wasting time, wasting effort, all of this thing. And these empty words give nothing. Empty words give nothing. And that's not God's plan. You know what? And these words, you are either going to speak and receive words of life or words of death. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of a tongue. So when you listen to people with empty words, you are listening to death. Is that really what we want to listen to? There has to be more discernment in the body of Christ. Not just about who's, you know, like, you know, end times and all that kind of stuff, but what am I actually listening to? What is the discernment of God in this? What is God actually saying? Because these empty words will distort, disrupt, and almost destroy what God is wanting to do. So don't. And then he says in verse 7, the reason that you don't associate with them, he says, because empty words will bring you into the company of these people. And as you step into company with these people, you catch the defilement of them. You catch their defilement. Who knows, you can go to a pub, not smoke, not drink, just go to the pub with a mate, maybe have a glass of lemonade and walk out of the pub and smell like you're smoking and drinking simply because you were in there. Maybe you went in for a pub meal. Nothing wrong with a pub meal, good value. But you walk out smelling like, like you've been you know, partaking. And the same thing, he says, you listen to these empty words, you're going to bring you into their company and you're going to be defiled by it. So this is, this is what, what these verses are, chapters 5 and the first part of chapter 6. What they are, Jesus Christ is actually laying down. You live according to this and this is an, this is an authority over you to keep you safe. This is protection for you. He says, I don't want you to associate with empty words. I don't want them coming into your soul. I don't want them affecting you. I don't want you to walk not, I don't want you to walk in in um in idolatry. I want your heart wholly and solely with me. And so Jesus is saying, if you walk this way, then the authority of God is over your life and you are protected. But when we're not protected and stuff happens, maybe we should come back to these verses and see if we've given legal entrance to anything that has been going on. Verse 8, for once you were darkness, past, but now you are, present tense, light in the Lord. Once you were trapped by darkness, once you were in the kingdom of darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. Again, the word walk. Remember, it's about five or seven times throughout the book of Ephesians. Walk worthy. Walk in love. Walk as God would walk. Walk in. He says here, I want you to walk as children of light. Children of light. You are flooded with light. Ephesians 1.17 says that, you know, God wants... Um, for a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. You are to walk in the light as children of light. You bear light. You are the light. In, in Matthew, it says that you are the light of the world. So let your light shine. And then in verse 9, it says, uh, for the fruit of the light, the effect of light, is every form of kindly goodness, righteousness, and trueness of life. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. This is an innocence. This gives you an impeccable integrity. When you walk like this, it's an impeccable integrity. And integrity guards your paths. You've just got to read Proverbs to see how important integrity is. And then it actually guards you. It's like a bodyguard. It protects you in the walk of life. And so he's saying right here, I want you to understand that when you walk in the light, there is a goodness, there is a righteousness, there is a truth that is revealed within you and upon you. And so there is a protection for you in every aspect of life. There is an integrity that is impeccable because it starts from the throne of God and is released in you and through you. There is an unstained innocence that comes upon you. And so this is why he's saying it is so important that if you recognize there is any kind of darkness in you, any kind of shadow on the soul, then you come before him and say, God, 
I want your light. I need your light. I need this to cleanse me. I need your light in my heart. I need your light to flow through me, to wash away any darkness, any shadows on my soul, anything that would distort the truth and, and, and distort the vision. So I'm not seeing the truth and the light of God, but I'm walking in a shadow. I'm walking in something that's deceptive. So he's saying, come before me because I want to wash away the shadows. I want to get rid of the darkness. I want to get rid of those things so that you truly are the light of the world. Oh, glory to God. You've got such a high calling such a high calling but we look at these things as though we're people in the world when you're not people in the world you are new creation realities you've got a you're a brand new being and so he's saying here you understand who you are you are the light of the world you're an image bearer of god therefore you can't go back to living like a human being you cannot go back to living in the flesh you can't go back to to the culture of the society that you're living in you can't go back there. You're a new creation reality. And Paul's saying, I'm just reminding you that you've got to walk as children of the light, that you're image bearers of God. This is who you are. Do not get sucked back into what you came out of. Can't. You've, there, there is such a high call upon you doesn't matter what you're called to. There is such a high call to live as Christ, to live according to the truth, to be led of the Spirit, to be an image bearer of God. You carry his glory. You carry his presence. You are new creation realities. Do not go back. Don't do a Lot's wife thing and look back. It's not worth it. Don't look back with fondness. Don't look back and think life was simpler. Who, who has thought I have? Life was simpler, easier, not as complicated before I got saved. That is a straight out life in the pit of hell that nearly every Christian has bought into at one stage or another. But how, how could it be when before salvation I was on a one-way ticket to hell? So anything after that surely has to be better in every way. It's just that I've got to learn to think differently, live differently, be different. So we were trapped in the dark, but now we're flooded with light. And that light brings goodness, righteousness and truth. It's an impeccable integrity. And verse 10, he says, I want you to try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. I was shocked that the Lord did not enjoy law and order. <laughs> Seriously. I enjoyed my, my detective show, right? Like, and then, you know, like, can't do it anymore. So it was really hard walking away from it. I kind of went on a bit of a binge. Like, if I can't have this anymore, I'm going to stuff it in now. Right? But, but I can't watch it anymore. I've got to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And what is pleasing to him is sometimes quite shocking to us because we don't quite see it the way he does. But then he says, the Amplified says, let your life be a constant proof of what is most acceptable to him. Let your life be a constant proof of what is acceptable to him. See, what we had here this afternoon was God's delight over the house, the goodness of God, the delight of God, we heard the song that he sang to us, which we normally sing to him, right? The delight of God is over this. So the choices that we make will either release or withhold the tangible presence of his delight. So what do we choose? Who wants to learn what's, what's delightful to him? I do. I do. And sometimes it's just really not what we think it is. So we have to live in the light and walk in love. 
So as you've given that out, why don't you just now privately talk to God? What do you want? Do you want him first? Do you want to uh, learn to choose what is beautiful to him? So you can walk that out. And we'll take communion again as you want a little bit later. But he's presenting choices before us here. And judgment begins in the house of the Lord, and that's not a threat. And if you look at that judgment, what he's doing when he brings that before us, he's giving you time to choose which way you're going to go. So we choose God. We choose to side with God. We choose to live with God. We choose to just please God. So why don't you just take a couple of minutes and just take communion and just settle some issues in your heart. God's got your number. Just whenever you're ready. So every time we partake of communion, we're having a covenant meal. I receive your covenant, God. I just rededicate myself to covenant lifestyle. So all of, of chapter 5 is basically contrasting lifestyles and saying choose. Just choose. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Let your life be a constant proof of what is most acceptable to him. Verse 11 says, Take no part in, have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness. But instead, but instead, let your life be so in contrast as to expose, reprove, and convict them. So what he's saying here is you can have no association and no connection with darkness of any kind. Light is your lifestyle. You cannot even accompany somebody. Well, well you can't get involved in any of that kind of stuff. And But he's because light dispels the darkness. So he's saying as your light shines upon um fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness, as your light shines, it brings a conviction, it exposes, it reproves, it convicts, it brings revelation. Remember in the book of Joshua, four times he was told, be strong and courageous. Um, four times, be strong and courageous. And it was for four different reasons. One was be strong and courageous for the sake of the people. One was be strong and courageous because it gives God a testimony. One was be strong and courageous because of what I'm doing for you. And the fourth one was be strong and courageous for the sake of the rebellious who will not listen, but they will be convicted or exposed by your lifestyle. And so what he's saying is here, that the more you walk in the light, you don't have to say anything really unless the Holy Spirit tells you to, but just your very presence, who you are, the, the God that you carry, the glory that is on you, the light that you live in will convict, it will expose, it will, it will bring, 
It will overturn the darkness. Light always dispels the darkness. And, and I don't understand sometimes why Christians are so afraid to enter into dark places. Where else do you think your light's going to shine? Where else would it shine? It's not going to shine in the light. You are the light. And you just make the light brighter. But, you know, we're supposed to be light in the darkness. We're supposed to bring light to dark places, dark people, dark hearts. The minute you step in, you step in as an ambassador for Christ. The minute you step in, you, re you represent heaven's government. The minute you step in, you're the light bringing, bringing light into the darkness. You bring change. You bring transformation. It's not about you. It's about who you carry on the inside. It's about the anointing that's on you. It's about the mantle, the glory that you carry. It's all about that. If we think it's about us, no. But it's about who we, who we serve. It's about him. And so in this, this thing, he says, don't have any association with any kind of darkness, but let your lifestyle, your light, expose, reprove, convict, and be a revelation to the darkness that's around you. And then in verse 12, he said, it's a shame even to speak or mention things that are practiced in secret. All those little, little gossipy things when we put our hand up over our mouth. We should not speak anything in secret. That is of darkness. Right. I am sick and tired without taking on the sick and tiredness, but I am over. Let me put it that way, over. How can I put this? I'm just over it. I am over Christians, no one in this house, I'm looking up. I'm over Christians <laughs> telling me what the devil is doing, that he's active here and he's doing this there and doing that somewhere else. So what? Tell me what the Holy Spirit's doing. Tell me where the Holy Spirit's breathing. Show me where God's hand is present. Let's concentrate on life. I don't need to know about the death. That'll take care of itself. I just need to flow with the life of the Holy Ghost. I just need to know where God's working. If I can see where God's working and I can come and join in there, then my being caught up in all of that kind of stuff is not going to happen. Because when we get caught up in that kind of fruitless deeds of darkness, we get defiled. And sometimes we get affected by it. Sometimes our path gets a little bit diverted off the true path. Just concentrate on where, look, I used to have coffee with a guy, dear God in heaven. Seriously, we would be sitting there having a coffee. And then all of a sudden he would say, oh, mind control. Somebody was putting mind control on him. Oh, there's witches. Oh. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm doing okay. They're not affecting me. But he was more concerned about the demonic than about the angelic. More caught up with what the devil was doing than about what God was doing. And if you've got the mind of Christ, how can you come under mind control? Like seriously, we have the mind of Christ. I've got to stop saying seriously. We have the mind of Christ. If I have the mind of Christ, it cannot be altered it cannot be affected. It's the mind of Christ, the anointed mind. If you know who you are in Christ, then a lot of the stuff that's blurted out shouldn't affect us if we know who we are. But in this, God is saying, or Paul is saying, there is such a distinct separation that needs to come. And so we look at the church, generally speaking, and we think, God, why isn't there a really divisive, redemptive line between the, the body of Christ and the people of the world. Why is it that we are as sick as the people in the world? Why is it that we have as much financial problems as the people in the world? Why is our divorce rate as bad as the world's? Actually, it's a little bit higher than the world's. Maybe we haven't separated ourselves. Maybe we've just kind of gone along to church Enjoyed church, great sermon, gone home and come back next week. Maybe we need to change. 
because God isn't going to. His standard of holiness is not going to change. His mandate for purity on this house, I don't want it withdrawn. It is what it is and we've said yes to it. But why isn't there more of a redemptive division between the world and the body of Christ? Because I think we've taken a lot of his verses in the word as optional instead of a command. Like people say, I don't really know what the will of God is for my life. I have to be so careful how I answer that. Because I want to say, are you giving thanks in everything? Because that is the will of God for your life in Christ. Are you giving thanks in everything? Because that's his will. Are you counting it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations? That's his will. So don't tell me you can't find the will of God. It's very plain. And I don't think that he shows us a specific will for our lives until we're actually living the general one that's in the book for everybody. And if I'm a little bit harsh, I don't want to be harsh. I want to be loving. But I want to see you live as new creation realities. And I want to see you living with a supernatural power and a supernatural anointing upon your life where you can walk into situations and people are healed by your shadow, when you can step into situations and darkness flees, when you can step in and you can take control over things that are not right just because of your presence. I want to see you raising a family for generations that will stand before God and will live for God and will live covenant for him. I do not want to see half-hearted, half-baked Christians coming out of this house. I want, I want a passion and a fire for the things of God. I want to see purity and holiness and translucence and, and everything, that everything that Christ has given us because I feel like he died and was buried and rose again and ascended to give me a certain quality of life and I'm still at this level and his quality of life is up here because he didn't come to show you the way to heaven. He came to bring heaven to earth. And what he said was it's not about going to heaven. It's about living an abundant life a life of more abundance. I want to teach you how to live. That's what Jesus came for because when he came down, he brought heaven down to earth. And then he says, I want you to teach. I want you to live a heavenly life upon the earth. I want to teach you how to live. A little bit different than, you know, just hang on there till we get up there. Jesus said, occupy until I come back. Take the ground and keep the ground. Make a difference. Transform something. Do something. Have a destiny. Reach for something that's bigger than yourself. Go for something. Have a purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, ask him for one because he'll download it so quick. We're here to make a difference. We're here to make a difference. I was, I was speaking last night when I went up and ministered in Brisbane, the first time, because I've been praying and praying, you know, like good, good, good Christian woman, praying, 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 praying for my kids, praying for this, praying for this, praying for that. And he said to me one day, he says, leave your shopping list outside. Just come in and sit with me, but don't bring any requests. And I'm like, what? But, but I need these answered. I need money, I need the kids sorted out, I need this happen, that to happen, I need whatever it was. I need leave the shopping list outside and just come and sit with me. He said, I will tell you what I want you to pray. And when you pray what I tell you to pray, your concerns will be taken care of. And so it was okay, leave your shopping list outside and come and sit with him. Father, what is it that you would like me to carry in prayer for you today? What do you want me to pray for? How can I serve you, Father, instead of expecting you to serve me? Because that's what we do when we go in and we have our shopping list. We expect him to serve us when we should be going in and serving him. And he allows us that grace of having a shopping list and praying because we've all got to grow into a maturity. He allows us to process through these things. But at some stage... We have to stop coming to him as little kids and start behaving like adults, still childlike in the kingdom, 
But First John talks about young children, uh, little children, young men and fathers. At some stage, we've got to become young men and fathers or mothers. So, you know, just do it. Father, what is it that you want me to pray for? How can I serve you? I repent of expecting you to serve me all this time. You are not my sugar daddy. You're not my sugar daddy. So verse 12, um, verse 13. So when anything is exposed by the light, it's made visible and clear. And where everything invisible and clear, there is light. What he's saying here is revelation light is all that is necessary. You know, when Jesus said in Matthew 4, um, seek ye, no, not seek ye first, it's Matthew 6, the other one where he said that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. That word, word for the word of God is not logos, it's not the written word. It is the revelation, it's the rhema. What is the rhema that God has placed in your heart from the word of God? That is what God expects you to live by. The rhema word, what is the revelation that the Holy Spirit's given you? That's what he wants you to live by. We're expected to, the Logos is our, our boundary, but it's the revelations. It's when he speaks to you. It's when he drops something into your heart. That's what you live by. That's what you live by, every revelation. And so we need the light for that. And then he says in 15, look carefully, or sorry, 14, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon you and give you light. Oh, my gosh, that's like Isaiah 60, isn't it? Like a rise from the prostration and the depression in which circumstances have kept you. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Um, you know, like, oh, my gosh, just rise up, wake up, get up and shine. Awake from the hypnotism that Satan puts upon our thoughts that keep us thinking in a certain way, even religiously, that he hypnotizes our thoughts and and so we're almost in a trance when it comes to certain ways of thinking that's the stronghold of the mind and what he's saying here is I need you to wake up from the hypnotized slumber and I need to resurrect you out of the death trap of enslaved thought enslaved thought that's um chapter 5 verse 14 And then he says, look carefully how you walk. Again, that word walk. Look carefully at this. Live circumspectly. Live purposefully, worthily, accurately. Don't be unwise. Don't be witless. Be wise, sensible, intelligent people. He says, look carefully at your own lifestyle. We are so good at examining everybody else's. Or am I the only one that does that? I repent. I repent. But we need to look at our own lifestyle, okay? Just trying to make it a little bit lighter. You know, but, but he says, we need you to have a look at this. <laughs> Live purposeful. Take accurate stock of your life. You know, um, there's a business guy that I follow. Um, he's more like a business coach. And he says about every three months to six months, you need to go away for three days with the Lord. And you sit there and you ask the Holy Spirit, how am I tracking with God? Holy Spirit, am I where I should be? Are there areas that I need to change? But he, he puts three days aside every three months at the, when he can, six months if he can't do the three months, but the whole time it's like, Holy Spirit, would you kind of audit my life? Not like Scientology audits. <laughs> but this is, this is Holy Spirit, I need you to just really diagnose because I can see what I want to see and I can think what I want to think and I, I think I'm doing okay. But I really need to know the truth. Where am I with God's plan? Am I on track? Am I on time? Where am I? Take accurate stock because wise conduct will always defeat foolish actions. 
Don't ever make a decision when you are tired. Don't ever make a decision after something major has happened. Give yourself time, at least three months, at least before you make any decisions after something's happened because you could make it foolishly out of the emotions that you're still working through. And, and who knows that sometimes your emotions can cloud the way. Sorry, I didn't mean to lean on the pulpit. Who knows that sometimes your emotions can actually cloud your spirit. And you think you're being led by the spirit, but actually it's the soul. Or you're being led by the soul, but man, your timing is so out. So he's saying, I need you to, to cheerfully, you know, look, look carefully. Con look, And he's saying, contrast your lifestyle. Make sure that your lifestyle does not reflect anything of the world's. So I can remember one pastor, I went away for a holiday with a friend of mine, and uh, one pastor at a, a church we went to when we were on holiday, he said, because it was the time of the, the Titanic movie, and he said, if the world is flocking to it, don't touch it. And I thought, whoa, how many times have I gone to a movie or something because it was a good movie and the world has flocked to it? If the world is flocked to it, don't touch it. And then he says in verse 16, you've got to make the most of the time. You've got to buy up every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Who knows that sometimes our days are evil? You've just got to look at some of the legislation to see our days are evil. You've just got to look at sometimes what they're teaching our kids in schools to see that the days are evil. So he says, I need you because the days are evil, because of the times that you're living in, I need you to make sure that there is nothing of the world, nothing of the enemy's camp in the way that you're living. You've got to spend your days for his purposes because wisdom will convert time into opportunity and wisdom will free you uh, from days of grind to grace. Who knows that sometimes, you know, like our work can be a bit of a grind. But when you listen to him and when you're following him and when you've got the wisdom of God, there is a grace, not a grace to do whatever you flip and please because that's not God's grace. God's grace teaches you to live a life of, of disciplined holiness according to Titus. And so he's saying here, understand you, the days are evil, so you need to be able to, to walk away from everything that's in the world. In verse 17, don't be vague, thoughtless or foolish, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Firmly grasp. So if you don't know what it is, give thanks in everything. Count it all joy. Start with the basics. But also pray Colossians 1.9. God, I ask you to fill my heart with the full, deep and clear knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so I can walk worthy of you, so I can fully please you, so I can bear fruit in every good thing and grow and increase in and by the knowledge of God. You know, so we've got to make God's master plan our meditation. That's what you meditate. God's master plan for your life or the scripture that you think will take you into it. But we need to pick up the art of meditation again. And then in verse 18, there is again this stark contrast. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't get drunk with wine. That's debauchery. But ever be filled and stimulated by the Holy Spirit. What he's saying here is, you know, there's there's two kinds of intoxications. Which one are you going to choose? You can choose to go the way of the world, you we can choose to go the way of the spirit. And you need to be, we need to know what it is to live under the intoxication or the inebriation of the Holy Spirit, not just in church meetings, but all the time you need to be so drunk so you have to think about what a drunk is like can't wait for the next drink just fill just fill it up or more sh more give me more they want more they want it they, they will they will take the last bit of money that they've got they'll take it out of their wife's housekeeping they'll do anything or the husband, wife will take it out of his whatever I need them gender neutral, but um, but you know but you know what it is you, you do anything for that next drink for that next high 
anything. You can't wait for the pub to open. You've got bottles in the house. Anything so you can stay intoxicated, so you can medicate your own pain, so you can find a way of living in a way that numbs the senses so that you can do this. But, but Paul is saying, oh, my gosh, forget that. Because if you want to know what a high is, you need to know the high of the Holy Spirit. When you get inebriated by him, when you get intoxicated by him, when you come under his influence, there's a high that nothing else can ever reach. And we need to be ever being filled, ever being filled, not just a top up, but ever being filled, stimulated by the Holy Spirit. I need to see a lot more drunk people in the house, guys not just occasional splishes and splashes, but I want to see people so caught up in the Holy Ghost, so in, in led by him, so filled, so stimulated by the Holy Spirit. But, you know, we're supposed to be led by him, really hard to be led by him if we're on a handshake kind of a, a, a when is it, companionship. Oh, my gosh. Holy Spirit, get him. Just get them. I have every morning I say this for Holy Spirit. Spirit of the Lord rests upon me. So the first thing I say is, Spirit of the Lord, would you make me a woman of rest so you can rest upon me? Make me a woman of rest. I want you to rest upon me. He can't rest upon someone that's not restful. So make me a woman of rest so you can rest upon me. And I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and understanding. I thank you for the spirit of counsel and might. I thank you for the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, for this makes me of quick understanding. And Holy Spirit, I want you to fill me. Holy Spirit, I want you to possess me. Holy Spirit, consume me. Holy Spirit, come and govern me and guide me. Holy Spirit, I surrender everything thing to you so come 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 fill me afresh and anew and holy spirit make me one of your burning ones for the glory of god for the good of people and for my joy make me a burning one glory to god whoa we need to know him so much more than what we do we need to know what it is to flow with him we you need to understand he can be a little bit moody in a good way, but a little bit moody. Sometimes it's a healing anointing. Sometimes it's a deliverance anointing. Sometimes it's just an anointing for peace. Sometimes it's an anointing for war. He's the spirit of war. He's the spirit of grace. He's the spirit of prayer and supplication. He is the spirit of, of so, he's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God. He's so the spirit of truth, the spirit of life. There's so many things about the Holy Spirit. And how can you flow with someone you don't understand or know? We need to know him. And so he's saying here, allow him to fill you up. Be overwhelmed by him. Come under his influence. Be intoxicated, inebriated. You need to be, you need to know a high that comes from the Holy Spirit that you're not going to know any other way because it's living in evil times. And you need to willfully choose a spiritual inebriation. We need to open up to being overcome by the Spirit of God. Because what wine offers is a lasting, is is not a lasting escape. Wine leaves and you're left with a hangover. I got drunk once in my life. Just once I tasted alcohol. Once it was too much. And I spent the night making love to the toilet bowl. <laughs> and I thought never again am I ever going to touch anything that's alcoholic. But, man, I love the Holy Ghost. I love it when he takes me over because there's no there's no hangover, there's nothing. It's just pure joy, pure delight. It's just like I don't take, yeah, you know, like he just takes over. There's there's you're not even really responsible for your own actions because you're led by him and you're guided by him. And so he's the one that brings lasting delight. He's the one. You know, he's the one. And when you're inebriated with the Holy Ghost, when you're filled to the full with him, then you can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Then all sorts of things will come out. And so in verse 19, it says, I need you to speak out to one another. Because you're inebriated by the Holy Ghost, because you're filled with him, I need you to speak out to one another. He says, don't let the music stop. Continue to touch the Lord 
with whispers of worship. He said, I want you to sing scripture. I want you to sing hymns, psalms, and, and hymns and spiritual songs. So and when we were, Shelley, like a little bit ago, just a tad, there used to be scriptures in song, right? And you would sing it. And, and because it was scripture, it would build a faith and you would get revelation. It was just awesome. And then I'm sort of like, I'm desperate for you. No, I'm not desperate for you. I've got you. I'm, I'm, I'm a God chaser, but I've already got you. So there's so many songs today that I can't even really relate to because scripturally, yeah, not quite right. Scripturally, not quite there. And you sort of, yeah, no, I won't sing that line. And I, because I, I learned that from Kathy Walters, we were at one one meeting that she came out for, and we were at a combined meeting, and they were singing a song, and she stood next to me. She said, "Don't ever sing that. It is embalmed in unbelief." <laughs> she said, "Just sing in the spirit." And she said, "I spend most of my time in modern meetings singing in the spirit because it used to be scripture, and scripture breath gave life. It brought faith." It was amazing. So he said, I want you to, to, to sing, you know, psalms. So I was at one church. Oh, my gosh, it was such a challenge because I do not have a singing voice at all. Can't find a key, can't keep it. Oh, no, I've, uh, my father said to me once, shut up, girl. <laughs> Why would you try out for the choir? So I didn't. <laughs> but... Um, um, what was I saying? Where was I going? Singing. Yeah, it's just it, it's just so powerful when you sing scripture. In this church, they would actually put people on the spot and say to them, would you please sing Psalm whatever in a song? And you're thinking, I'm not even sure of the song. Like, is it happy or sad? Like, like what, you know, but they expected people, if you went there, it was just random just go for it we'll pick up we'll pick Shane because he's got a good voice but, <laughs> but, they, but they would have they'd ask them to sing the psalms because that's what scripture said right sing psalms or we'll sing scripture but then sing hymns those beautiful old hymns that have so much depth to them they're beautiful I think it should be mandatory that we have one hymn of a Yeah, but but just the words of the hymns written by those those people of old, they're just so deep and strong and full of biblical truth and power and anointing. They all look it. And then the other one was, was um, Psalms, Hymns and Spiritual Songs, which is what we had today. The Holy Spirit just launches on somebody and out of the depths of their being there just comes this song. And he said, I need you to speak these out to each other. I haven't heard too much of that. <laughs> but he says, I need you to do this because um, it will deepen your faith. As you, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, it will stop the weeds from growing in your minds because your heart, your soul is focused on something different. This is an antidote to depression and an antidote to darkness. And then he said in verse 20, give thanks in all things at all times for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father at all times and for everything. Do you know there needs to be an overflow of gratitude in our hearts, overflow of gratitude, just the overflow. And in the um, uh, Aramaic translation, it says give thanks to God for every person he brings into your life. That's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> but that's what it says. Give thanks to God for every person he brings into your life. So I had a, a, a woman I knew. She would start the morning off. She'd have a cup of coffee and she'd write a letter to God and sort of like, this is, this is the appointments I've got today. This is what's happening for business, da, da, da. So I'm just committing everything to you and this is what I'd like to work it out, but your will is best. So she'd just write a little letter. But at the end of the day, she'd have a cup of tea and she'd write a thank you note for God. And in that, she would note every person that she had connected with that day, whether it was by email, whether it was by phone call, whether it was on the street, whether it was family, 
And she would thank God for these people and pray that he would bless them. That's really, you know, she, was, she, she knew how to do it. Then verse 21, he says, I want you to support each other. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Support each other in love. Selflessly consider what's happening for the other person. Abandon yourself to love. Just abandon yourself to love. And he said, if you live like this, you'll be living under Christ's authority and by his protection. But there has to be, there has to be a stark contrast between our walk and the walk of the people in the world. The days are evil. And God is, God is kind of like, guys, you think, I haven't raised the bar. It's always been like this. It's just that sometimes we're, we don't really stop and think about it. And we can't do this in our own strength. There's no way we can do it in our own strength. And if I did it in my own strength, it wouldn't be acceptable to him anyway. I need the power of the word, but I need the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one who can do this in our lives. He's the only one who can bring a stark contrast. He's the only one who can remind you what the word of God says so that there's this line of redemption between you and the people of the world. He's the only one who can show you how to live so differently from the world that your provision comes straight from the vault of heaven, that you are completely set free from everything, that, that there's no darkness can come near you. And David Oyedepo, you know, my, my guy in Africa, oh, my gosh, he's amazing. But he says that he's just got to, um, they've got this wall compound because they've got a city of refuge, you know, with, and their church services run to about 700,000 a day. But it's a city of refuge and there's hospitals and um, schools. It's all there, I've heard before. But he says that people are lined up outside the gates wanting to come in, like for church services or whatever. But sometimes they just want to come in because they want refuge. And he says, but if he walks down to the gates, the demons flee. The demons flee because of how he walks and how he lives. And Tom Ingle said when he was there and he, he lived in, he stayed in the house with, with Bishop David or your depot. In the morning, he said to Bishop David, he said, how are you this morning? Uh, and he said, good. Yeah, always good, Tom. He asked him the second day, he says, good. And then Tom realised, oh, he's always good. Not a question to ask. But he walked in the word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is such a redemptive difference between him and the city of refuge that he has built and the, and the world around. I have always believed we will be a place of refuge. I'm not sure how big it's going to be, but it's bigger than this. And I also know that a city, that we will be a city set on a hill, that the light will draw people. And that's why the purity and the holiness and the consecrated lifestyle is so important. Nothing to do with us, but to do with his call, his purpose, his plan. And so we have this choice. How are we going to live? And even 90% Christian, 90% kingdom, 10% world is not pure. If you want something pure, it's 100%. And this is what he's wanting to do in us, but we can't do it. We can surrender to it. We can say, yes, God, I'm willing for you to work it out in me. I'm willing to submit to the process. I'm willing for you to mature me in this. Because he's so good. Yes. Because he is so, so good. So good. So you've all taken communion. 
but I want you to go home and just really like, Lord. And and he gives us different boundaries and, and I've broken my boundary more than once and I've paid the price for it. Not that he is really harsh about it, but it just opens the door to consequences. But my boundary is set no evil before your eyes, set no wicked thing before your eyes, which means a lot of the TV shows, my law and order. But that's my boundary. That might not be yours. So you've got to know the boundary. Samson, don't cut your hair. David, you're anointed to be king, but don't touch Saul. He's still the king. You can't touch him. You're just anointed. He's in the seat of governorship. So we all have different boundaries. Do you know yours? What is your boundary? What is it that God says, if you stay within this, you'll be safe? Samson, don't cut your hair. I don't care who you meet. I don't care how beautiful she is. Don't cut her hair. Suzette, don't let any wicked thing be in front of your eyes. That was mine. What's yours? Because it needs to be this, this, we need to just cut off the world. 